Well, thank you very much, Matt. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you all today. So thank you to Matt and Rosemary and all of the partners who have helped put the uh, uh, conference together, to Jason and the board, uh, well done. It's a real pleasure to be at the Apprentice Employment Network as the Liberal Party spokesperson on training and skills, uh, workforce population strategy. Uh, we are unashamedly, unambiguously pro-apprenticeship when it comes to training and we put a very high value on the important role that group training organisations play within the broader training sector to skill South Australia's future workforce. Um, I'm going to offer you the reasons why, not because I don't think you're aware of them, but because I think it's probably useful for you to have an understanding of why I think they're important from our perspective, why your work is so important. Number one, you help apprentices. Your support, your mentoring, your assistance gets results. By and large, students are more likely to complete their training uh, when they go through a GTO. You reduce the risks to the apprentice and their family for that matter. Number two, you help businesses and South Australian industry. You ensure that businesses get the apprentices that they need and that they're trained in the manner that those businesses need. You provide the flexibility that is so important uh, by and valued by industry, which can sometimes be lacking uh, in the way that our public training provider, uh, any public training provider, goes about its business. And the third reason is that you help our state. By delivering higher levels of completion rates than the broader training sector, you ensure that the value of taxpayers' investments is maximised. You lift people's perception of skilled and technical qualifications make a real and active contribution to mitigating and ultimately, hopefully, overcoming our skills shortages. Supporting the broader training sector is in integral to the success of our state. So as Shadow Minister for Training and Skills, uh, I have a job to do. It's my job to hold the government to the day to account uh, and to offer an alternative policy uh, approach that can serve South Australia well. And I'll talk a little bit about both of those things today. First, in relation to holding the government to account. I don't want to be a downer. I don't have any interest in attacking the minister personally. I think he's probably doing the best he can uh, to get good outcomes within the limitations that are imposed on him by being part of an ideologically union-led government with an ideological mindset that favours government-owned training providers over non-government providers and political marketing exercises over potentially less glamorous policy alternatives that might get better results. What do I mean by political marketing exercises? Let's look at the signature policy of the state and federal labour parties when it comes to training at the moment. Fee-free TAFE. Now why is it called fee-free TAFE? Somebody's paying, after all. It's called that because no fees are charged to the person doing the training. A student going to TAFE SA for a fee-free TAFE course doesn't get charged a fee. It's a catchy title. It sounds good to anyone who's not potentially intimately involved in the training sector. On the other hand, policy basically requires people to do unpaid training without there necessarily being a guarantee that there's a job at the end of the training for those who complete. There was reporting recently of some federal figures suggesting the completion rates were below 20%. I asked the State Minister about this in the Parliament recently. He advised the figure is much higher in South Australia. Uh, 45% he said, of fee-free TAFE students whose courses have completed have in fact now completed that course. So as we know, success is more likely when someone has skin in the game. Uh, we all remember the Skills for All disaster. Fee-free TAFE, 45% completion rates. That, to my mind, uh, is not good enough. I know that those figures, they may go up and down in the coming months. Different cohorts will finish, different uh, cohorts have started at different times, but I really wouldn't be celebrating 45% completion rates too loudly if I were the Minister. I know the Minister has been critical of the previous government in certain areas where completion rates of better than 45% were achieved. I know the Minister also told us that the 45% completion rate for the fee-free TAFE courses within TAFE SA was higher than the broader completion rate for other TAFE SA courses. That, to my mind, is not good enough. Every investment in public policy is a decision to fund one thing over an alternative. The fee-free TAFE policy requires significant financial investment 
that is therefore no longer available to fund alternative approaches that might put a greater emphasis on, for example, uh, more apprenticeships and traineeships. Apprenticeships, to my way of thinking, are the original fee-free TAFE course. In fact, they're better than that. From the apprentice's point of view, not only are you not asked to pay for the training, we'll actually pay you while you're doing the training. You even get paid to be there. You're in a job, in a workplace that you get to know. Now, it's a tautology, but I was considering suggesting we change the title of apprentices and trainees to paid apprentices and paid trainees, just in case anyone had missed the point and thinks that fee-free TAFE is some sort of landmark training policy. The other big political marketing exercise that this state government has is their Technical Colleges project. It's $250 million in uh, a fair chunk of ongoing recurrent funding uh, to support new facilities in public schools in five locations, including a $1.2 million marketing exercise to attract students to Findon High School's Tech College. Each of the five is designed, when complete, to have 60 students uh, in year 10, 11 and 12 across three industry areas uh, that are relevant to their local areas, whether in Port Augusta, Mount Gambia, uh, Tonsley, uh, The Levels or Findon. The Premier announced a little while ago, uh, as if it was the first time that this had ever happened, that when students completed year 12 at Findon High's Technical College, they'd be guaranteed entry into an apprenticeship or other relevant job upon leaving school. Again, these are words designed to make people feel warm and happy about the program. And if they don't have much familiarity with vet in schools, sounds great. But you know what, I'd be a lot more impressed if they were getting a lot more than 300 pre-apprenticeship students per year for their $250 million investment. That's money that could have been spent on a range of other programs. And you know what, we got a lot more students than that to actually start and be in apprenticeships while still at school under the previous government for a great deal less money. But we definitely didn't have as catchy a title or as expensive a marketing campaign for it. I really don't have a problem with building nice new facilities for public schools. When I was education minister for four years, we commissioned $1.5 billion worth of work to improve public education sites across South Australia. More than 100 public schools benefited. We built five new public schools. The problem isn't spending capital in terms of improving our public schools. My problem is characterising a major training policy initiative uh, that is supposed to solve our skills shortage, ensure we have the workers we need to deliver on our potential within AUKUS, meet our skills shortages in the construction industry, in the hospitality industry and so much more, to say that these five building projects in our public school network are going to do that as one of the two major skills training policies of the government, to me that is not good enough. It, it is uh, taking the choice to take funding away from other apprenticeship and traineeship pro programs by state and federal labour has, in my view, had negative consequences for our nation and for our state. So go to the latest NCBER figures, released last month. They show that South Australia has suffered a dramatic decline in the number of apprentices and trainees in training since Labor took office. A 14.9% decline from 29,090 in March 2022 to 24,765 in March 2024. 29,000 to 24,500. The in-training numbers are, of course, set to get much worse in the next couple of years because apprenticeship and traineeship commencements are down 48.5% since Labor came to power, from 17,870 in the 12 months leading up to March 2022, compared to 9,205 in the 12 months leading up to March 2024. 17,870 to 9,205. It's a dramatic drop. Completion rates have been slowly on the increase as the large increases year on year throughout the term of the Liberal government. <coughs> Those students have been completing. But as that increasing cohort in 2020, 2021 complete apprenticeships and the decline in apprenticeship commencements starts to hit the road, you'll see those completion rates drop dramatically as well. And that's a real shame. The trend points to a moment of significant jeopardy, of risk for our state, that we might revert back to Labor's previous record in training. 
From 2012 to 2018, I'd characterise this as the worst performing states in the country, certainly when it came to the numbers in training, the numbers of commencements and completions. We turned that around from 2018 to 2022 with growth every year. But since March 2022, we've subsided into decline. Apprenticeship commencements in critical skills required for our AUKUS program, for example, such as engineering, ICT and science, have dropped by 69% since Labor came to office, from 785 in the year to March 2022, to 395 in the March 2023 figures, to 240 in the most recent figures, the 12 months to March this year. Meanwhile, newly released research and analysis from Build Skills Australia has identified a workforce shortfall of nearly 20,000 in the construction industry by next year, which they predict will go to more than 47,000 by 2035 under current settings. Other industry groups from hospitality to motor mechanics, from childcare to personal support, have all been telling the opposition they've been exasperated by the workforce shortages they're experiencing with little relief in sight. My view is that Labor's big spending, low impact policies are not getting the job done. So, the question that is reasonable to ask and is always asked of me at this point, what would we do differently? Um, I promised I would talk about policy alternatives. Now, when I was here last year, many of you were here, uh, probably about half to two thirds of you were here, judging by the numbers. It's a great turnout today, so well done to the AEM. Um, but at last year's speech, I said at this point that we would be uh, not making major specific funding commitments until later in the term. For the most part, that remains true. But at the end of the day, the big funding decisions, they change from year to year. And with an election not until March in the year after next, a major commitment that I might make today could well be obsolete by the time of the next election. So the comments I'm going to make today are not a comprehensive training policy, but they do represent, in my view, some suggestions about reform, reform areas that I think are priorities. A couple of topics that I think the government should change today. Things that shouldn't necessarily need to wait for an election. And the first one, and this is an exception to my rule earlier because this is an ounce of policy that we've committed to from the Liberal Party relates to payroll tax. We've committed to lifting the threshold for payroll tax to $2.1 million on payroll. And we've committed to excluding apprentices and trainees from the calculation uh, of that payroll tax. When a business takes on an apprentice, it's investing in its future to be sure, but they're also investing in the future of that apprentice. They're investing in the future of their broader industry, which will benefit from the skills that their apprentice develops, and they're investing in the productivity and the prosperity of our state. There are not too many businesses that will tell you that they, import, they report significant productivity gains from the first year of having that apprentice on board. Far from it. And when we charge the business payroll tax on that wage, in my view, it's a pretty poor way to say thank you to that business for their investments in our state's future. We should always be looking to make it easier for businesses to take on apprentices and trainees. And this is one we have identified that we will deliver and we hope that the government follows suit. To this point, uh, they've said that it's not their priority. They have a budget this year, sorry, next year. They have a budget the year after uh, that, that they'll be looking to make the election promises for. We hope they join us, but if they don't, we will continue to argue, argue strongly for this measure. Next one is in relation to GTO Boost. Um, I described before how group training organisations tend to get much higher completion rates from their apprentices than non-GTO approaches. You're able to support those apprentices that might fall out with an employer, for example, by moving them to a different workplace. You also build in mentorship programs for those that need it. You tend to be particularly focused on supporting training in the ways that industries need. Of course, there's a cost to the business for using a GTO rather than directly employing the apprentice. The benefit is that it de-risks the engagement of the apprentice and many businesses are only willing to engage an apprentice through a GTO. During the term of the previous government, we provided significant funds to support businesses to bridge that gap in cost to use a GTO, at least for the apprentice's first year through the GTO Boost program. This funding, amongst other measures, encouraged many businesses to take on their first ever apprentice. Unfortunately, over the last couple of years, Labor has reduced the funding and the scope of the program. This year, it sits at, I think, 260 places at a cost to South Australian taxpayers of $1.35 million. It's limited to supporting mature age apprentices only. 
Command, this is a prime example of a program that suffered with significantly reduced funding as a result of Labor's decisions to instead fund their political marketing exercises. In my view, uh, when the Minister is next speaking to AEM, he ought to announce a major boost to the GTO Boost program. He could start by doubling it, but that won't be enough. He should triple it. Scaling up from 260 places, the current number, to 780, would come at a cost to the budget of about $2.7 million extra per year. $2.7 million extra per year. If you look through the South Australian budget papers, you will find many, many opportunities to compare and contrast unfavourably the decisions they've made uh, with this one that I propose today. Happy for the Minister to go higher than tripling it, but it would make a really good start. I also think that they should broaden the eligibility criteria for access to this program to enable us use to support employment of any first year apprentice in identified areas of skill shortage, not just mature age apprentices. I can guarantee these spots will be taken up. I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that. It'll help businesses, it'll help GTOs, it'll help the state meet its needs, but most of all, it'll help those apprentices. I don't know if the Minister's minded to make such an announcement. I don't want to get your hopes up. Uh, but if he does, then we'll be supportive, we'll welcome it, and if he doesn't, here's the space you can expect the Liberal Party to talk a lot more about in the lead-up to the next election. In other areas of potential reform, there are a wide range of suggestions people have made about where further funding could be spent, from wage subsidies to driving lessons or car registration, noting that some roles already attract tools of trade allowances or similar things with different names, there may well be room for more incentive measures. Some people talk to me in great details about sign-on bonuses or milestone payments or employer subsidies or regional loadings and rates of payment. And I'll continue to listen to those ideas with interest. I'll work with our Treasury and Finance team, Sam Telfer, the Shadow Treasurer, Heidi Girolamo, the Shadow Minister for Finance and the leader, Vincent Tarsia, on what adjustments we might come to ahead of the election. Please keep bringing me those suggestions over the year ahead. One area that will definitely require some attention relates to how uh, we educate our community, our young people and their families, about the opportunities for great jobs and lasting careers through still skilled and technical pathways, such as apprenticeships and traineeships. It's critical earlier of a $1.2 million marketing uh, and advertising campaign for Finden High School enrolments. The reason I've been so critical of that campaign is that the money could have been spent on campaigning for skills across the board. It's not good enough to chase down students from one school, from the pool of those who are already interested. We need to change perceptions in our whole community and increase the level of interest in apprenticeship and traineeship pathways across the board. Now, I know you've heard this all before, probably every year from every Liberal and Labor spokesperson addressing the AEN for as long as you can remember. Just because successive governments have been talking about this for about 10 or 15 years, and as yet we have not yet uh, solved this successfully enough to our community, does not reduce its priority. It just means that we need to find better and more innovative ways to do it. And we can't drop the ball by wasting money on a campaign such as that which has been run, rather than focusing on solving the bigger issue. A lot of these education measures, of course, need to start within schools themselves. We'd like to see more access to try a trade and other vet programs from earlier, from Year 7. We've successfully moved Year 7 to high school under the former government since 2022, uh, and I think that we can fully, more fully now tap into the potential to give those Year 7 students the full benefit of that shift, working with industry groups, with training organisations and existing expo-type activities to broaden their appeal and make them also more available for junior secondary students. I'd like to see more access to pre-apprenticeship VET programs, Cert 2s or others, that can later contribute to apprenticeships as prior learning from Year 9. Apprentices may not be able to be taken on until they're 16, but if we can get school students engaged in this training earlier, if they know what path they want to be on, then they can get on that way to finishing their apprenticeship before they even start it. Let's also consider career counselling. It's a task, as we know, that's too often undertaken by teachers with space in their timetable rather than necessarily having a passion for the role. It's informed by, it needs to be informed by deep training and high quality information. 
Prior to our election loss in 2022, our former Liberal government had budgeted $20 million for the introduction of a network of professional career counsellors working across schools within our public education system. This funding was cut by the Labor Party to fund their election uh, promises and priorities, and effectively the project was channeled towards the development of an app. Now, we'll be taking a very close look at this space if it proves that the app is just, you know, brilliant and getting better results than anyone could have ever hoped, then, you know, we'll pay attention to that. Uh, if it can do the work of 40 professional career counsellors, or however many it's going to be, through the gift of artificial intelligence, and if it can do it effectively, accurately, persuasively, then I stand to be corrected. But to my way of thinking, I still think this cut was a bad mistake, and so we'll be looking very closely uh, at how this is going. So, given that I've just described the potential role of the career counsellor being taken over by an AI-informed app, it's worth noting that one aspect of career counselling that has accelerated rapidly in its importance over just the last two years, probably, is ensuring we're giving our young people the best possible advice about what careers and jobs are unlikely to make, be made redundant by AI by the time they finish their schooling, their training or their degree. Um, it's certainly true that there are many opportunities in areas that require apprenticeship pathways for jobs that are unlikely to be taken by robots. And this could well be a really appealing aspect for young people concerned about their future. One idea that's been recently put to me that we're thinking about that I'm interested in, I'd be interested in your perspectives too, is whether as governments or as businesses or as individuals, we should all be considering investing in broad opportunities for people to receive training in AI literacy, AI readiness, to how people can use AI to assist in their daily lives and enhance their lives and reduce risks. Uh, can I just take a poll? How many people in the room use ChatGPT on a, a weekly or a daily basis? Yeah, so it's about a third, maybe half the room, uh, familiar with it. Any, uh, if you use any other AI software other than ChatGPT. Uh, okay, that's another five. So about half of the, this room, this well-informed room, who's intimately involved in the day-to-day -day of work uh, and different work areas, uh, are familiar with this. This has, over the last two years, been an accelerating trend and is sort of new. So with that in mind, I asked my free base level chat GPT app on my phone last night what he thought of the idea of providing training. Here's what it came up with. In 10 seconds it provided this response. It said, artificial intelligence represents one of the most significant technological leaps in human history, comparable to the invention of the steam engine, electricity or the internet. Like these transformative innovations, AI is reshaping industries, redefining how we work, and unlocking possibilities who once thought impossible. ChatGPT has clearly got the talking points. However, AI's ability to learn, adapt, and perform tasks traditionally requiring human intelligence sets it apart as a tool with unprecedented potential. This leap is not just about efficiency, it's about fundamentally changing how we solve problems, create knowledge, and connect with the world. As AI becomes more integrated into society, it's essential that anyone understands, everyone understands its capabilities, limitations, and ethical implications. Accessible education about AI empowers individuals to make informed decisions and ensures equitable opportunities in an increasingly tech-driven world. By promoting AI literacy, we can foster innovation, reduce fears, and create a future where technology serves all of humanity. So says ChatGPT. Now, as someone who spent most of their adult life writing speeches or, you know, sometimes often giving them off the cuff, I'd like to think that ChatGPT isn't quite ready to take my job just yet. But given the dramatic increase in the power of this technology every year, you'd be mad to dismiss the impact that it'll have in our lives and in our work. As a policymaker, it's got my attention, and I'm sure that it will have all of yours soon, if it doesn't already. So, that's it. Thank you all for your patience as ever in listening to what I have to say. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you to the board for all of your work. And I'm happy to take some questions if you like.